Hi, everyone. We have an exciting Earth Day 2021 program for you today, all about women, technology, environment, and education. As the world prepares to celebrate Earth Day, we want to know how technology is being used to educate others about important environmental issues and how can the public get involved. The 2021 Earth Day theme of Restore Our Earth examines natural processes, emerging green technologies, and innovative thinking that can restore the world's ecosystems. This webcast will share new research findings and authentic learning projects that emphasize STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, and illuminate a path for youth and the public to become good stewards of the earth. Hi, Yvonne, thank you very much. I'm happy to be with you on this Earth Day 2021 and catch up on a few things since we've seen each other last. So thanks for this opportunity. Uh, so to share a little bit about my background and my career, essentially they're a modern day mashup of a few of my favorite things, studying whales, scuba diving, filming, and recording acoustics in remote places. I'm the co-founder of Spiral Pacific, a nonprofit organization about telling ocean stories and conservation. And I teach students ranging from grade two up to college level learners. I love to travel and learn about other cultures, human cultures, as well as whale culture. Next slide, please. So Sedna is the name of an all female team of polar explorers. And we work with groups in the Arctic to learn about indigenous communities, including the Inuit people of the far north and the Sami people of uh, Norway and Sweden. We get to take our cultural partners uh, from these areas to do something that a lot of people in the high north don't do, snorkel or scuba dive in their own backyard. <laughs> so that's kind of fun to, to get together with these women from all over the world. And we get to learn about the way that climate change is affecting them. And we share stories and then we bring up extra dry suits and equipment and we get to take these women in the water with us. So that could be snorkeling or diving among icebergs or my new favorite pastime, filming orca whales feeding in the fjords of Norway. So next slide, please. Now, because I wanted to learn more about whales, specifically which animals are echolocating or vocalizing, we had to figure out, you know, to try to figure out their language and see what we could understand from all of these communications which hit our ears at the same time and it's just hard to tell who's making the sound. So to do this, uh, I worked with some colleagues at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography's Marine Physical Lab. And what we created was a research platform called VAL, and that stands for Hydro Video Acoustic Logger. And the idea behind it is with two hydrophones at least three feet apart, so they're one meter apart, plus a camera in the center, we're able to get a differentiation um, and try to determine uh, at which animal is making the sound. So we took this and put this together right before our trip up to, uh, up to Norway and in the ice cold five degree water, the battery didn't last very long, but we did successfully get a few echolocations. So um, I'm excited to say that next time, um, this coming winter, when I head back up to Norway, uh, we'll have different batteries, a different um, system, and hopefully be able to get a little bit more data on the animals. So next slide, please. One of the things I'd love to use this new research platform VAL for actually is to take it back to a place I first visited in 2014, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, also known as the Eastern Pacific Gyre. So at that time, I joined an expedition with um, a group called Algalita, and we were out there to study and quantify how much plastic we found out there in the middle of the ocean. Well, we found something we did not expect at all. On day 11, some splashing astern led us to run to the back and look, 
and it was a pod of deep diving beaked whales. I'm a whale researcher and I have never seen anything like this. So we took some photos, it was raining, it was dark. You can see kind of in the lower corner and we thought, oh my gosh, I wish we had a better way of knowing what was happening with these animals. Well, as luck would have it, about three weeks later, we saw these animals again. This time the weather was flat and calm. They breached out of the water and we got some wonderful photos. And because of COVID being stuck here behind a computer for so long, um, we were able to share that with some whale experts and it ends up, those are no other than the ginkgo toothed beaked whales, which had never been documented alive previously. So with that exciting finding, we want to go and verify that they indeed live there. So we're working with different groups and seeing if we can find a vessel. And my team at Spiral Pacific wants to head back out there with this recorder and see what we can learn about the whales. Next one, please. So if you want to know what you can do, there's a lot of ways that you can help the earth and some of the special animals that live there, like these rare beaked whales that are in living in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch among our plastic debris. So let's be thinking about them a little bit and what we can do. And everyone knows reduce, reuse, recycle, but I'm here to say refuse, no straw please, don't need anything in styrofoam, I'll pass. Or if you do end up having to take a bag home, reuse it time and time again, and then dispose of it properly. Um, but we'd love you to uh, stay connected to Spiral Pacific and follow us through our journey, hopefully back out to the gyre to see these magnificent deep diving animals. We'll also be doing some upcoming beach cleanups, citizen science opportunities, and um, I'll be doing a webinar series on whales with a group called Blue Endeavors. So with that, I'd like to pass it off back to um, Yvonne and hear what our next speaker can share. Thank you. That was wonderful and exciting, Cynthia. And I can't wait to explore those resources a little bit more. Uh, and now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Elena Yulova. And Elena, tell us all about yourself and your programs. Elena, you're on mute. Hang on. <laughs> Hi, I'm really excited to participate in this teleconference. My name is Elena Yulaeva. I worked for many years at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. I'm a climatologist by training, uh, but now I'm working at Supercomputer Center and I'm doing research on internet uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, I'm also wearing multiple hats in my other life. I'm a founding director of VASC accredited San Diego Russian School for more than 20 years. We've been providing language instruction, Russian language and now Portuguese as well uh, to San Diego kids and adults. I'm also a founder and executive director of Community Commons, a 501c3 nonprofit, San Diego based nonprofit that uses global education and advanced technologies to inspire changes in the communities and improve communities. One of the missions of the community commons is to nurture a new generation of professionals that are skilled in modern technologies and know how to use uh, evidence-based uh, science and data science to uh, conduct the environmental ad advocacy. Uh, with this, uh, within this mission, uh, we, uh, we, we are involved in the Global Forest Link project that is a joint project with Global Schoolnet, where Ivan is an executive director. Uh, I will go and talk about it in a little bit. But uh, today I want to talk about a very exciting data analysis tool called SWAF, which stands for uh, uh, Survey and um, uh, survey analysis via visual exploration, and uh, we use this uh, tool in lots of our projects. And uh, this is an online pl platform for uh, analysis of surveys, image collection, um, and it is it integrates a visual, statistical, and uh, cartographic analysis. It also provides 
uh, a gateway into advanced data science and machine learning tools. Uh, it used in a number of different applications, but I'm going to show a couple of examples on how SWAV can be used in earth sciences. Next slide. Um, I already mentioned the Global Forest Link. It's a project that connects students from around the world to help them explore local environmental changes and share their findings through stories and photographs. One of the activities that students are involved in is the go into the forest and collect forest images and do forest surveys. And then they upload them uh, online and we use SWAF to manage these images and analyze them. And um, uh, students can then uh, use this results of this analysis in their uh, stories in their uh, videos and reports. More than uh, 2,000 students from all over the world participated in SWAV since its inception in 2015. Next slide. Uh, SWAV was used uh, in the uh, uh, to, to represent the Earth as art USGS remote sensing gallery. This is the uh, collection of satellite images that are valuable, uh, that have scientific value, but also they can be simply uh, uh, viewed as a as pieces of art because they are really intriguing. Uh, the satellites manage to capture incredible variety of views of the Earth. We can see rivers, we can see mountains, uh, deserts, uh, ice, etc. And uh, in addition to just an aesthetics of looking at it, you can also analyze these images with SWAF. Uh, for instance, looking at the color intensity by time of the day, dependencies of different landscape images on climate, etc. Next slide. Um, I naturally had a project uh, on African beds. They have a comprehensive list of the beds that are occurring in Africa and uh, surrounding islands. And this list is constantly updated to reflect new species and changes in habitats. Uh, so SWAF can be used to analyze these images and metadata, metadata between these images and to classify beds, analyze their behavior, and maybe track next COVID. Hope it will not happen. <laughs> next slide. Um, these are the camera trap images collected in tiger habitats in Thailand. Uh, we use this uh, during the workshop on uh, tiger habitat conservation in Thailand in 2014. Um, uh, SWAF can help uh, not just to analyze the images to, to uh, analyze tiger's behavior, etc., but also to track and prevent poaching. Because for the tigers, uh, the um, the patterns of their skin, it's like uh, human fingerprints. Basically when uh, the uh, law enforcement agencies see the skin of dead animals, they can actually track them to the pictures from the uh, camera traps and, uh, and deduce where the tigers were killed and do some preventive measures there, implement some preventive measures there. Uh, next slide. And this is the last example uh, that I want to show. Uh, these are the butterfly samples uh, that were collected by University of Florida uh, researchers. And uh, to me, they all seem pretty similar, but are, they're not the same. And SWAF uh, can be used together with Jupyter notebooks uh, to classify images uh, using the most uh, advanced machine learning algorithm. Mm -hmm. And they're doing it uh, in real time. And like you can uh, visually 
appreciate the machine learning and the beauty of the nature. Uh, this is the last slide. I really encourage um, you to go and check uh, the SWAF and the, uh, the uh, URL is on the first page and uh, to play with all the applications that are there. And I'm, uh, now I'm going to turn it back to Ivan and to the next presenter. Thank you, Elena. Those, those were all great examples of using women using technology um, to raise awareness, environmental awareness, and educate others. Um, so now it's my pleasure to introduce, introduce Beth Bessem. And it, hi, Beth, please uh, introduce yourself and tell us about your project. Great. Well, um, I'm just so pleased to be here to celebrate Earth Day with you. Uh, I think we can all agree there's nothing more important than taking care of our planet and Earth Day is always a good reminder of that. Now, I just wanna draw your attention to the beautiful art that you see on your screen. This is part of a project that I've been working on with the Walter Monk Foundation for the Oceans for the last two and a half years. It's called the Map of the Grand Canyons of La Jolla. And I'd like to tell you a little bit more about it. Next slide, please. But first I'll introduce myself. Uh, my name is Beth Beesom. Uh, I am uh, with the Walter Monk Foundation for the Oceans. I'm an educator there. I was also the project manager for the installation of the map. Now, I've included some other pictures of me and other parts of my life. I am a scuba instructor. I've worked in the Caribbean. I've worked in the Pacific Islands as well and here in the United States. I'm also the person on the horse. I have worked as a mounted sergeant in New York City with the parks police there. I'm also the person jumping off the pier into the Hudson River. I'm trained in search and rescue. Uh, and that part of my law enforcement job as well. And if you look in the bottom right hand corner, this is actually uh, right before the pandemic, I was uh, in Samoa and I was working there teaching diving. And also I was able to bring an underwater ROV program there and take it into the villages and introduce the children there to that but we can't be all work and no play. So I've included some of the things I like to do in my, in my uh, free time. And I'm an underwater photographer. I love to go here in La Jolla and go scuba diving there. I also uh, worked for a number of years in the theater in New York City. I created costumes for New York City Ballet, for Broadway. And nowadays I like to take my sewing skills and I make um, felt creatures uh, out of photographs that hopefully I take and then uh, turn them into art with felt made from recycled plastic bottles. Next slide, please. But let me talk about the map. So this picture gives you a, a picture of the scope of this project. Uh, the map is called an educational plaza. It's located in Kellogg Park in La Jolla. It's the largest litho mosaic in the world. It measures over 2,500 square feet or the size of nine school buses. Now, as you can see from the photo, the map faces out in towards the Pacific Ocean and it offers us a glimpse of what's underwater right out in front of us. So the different color blues of tile show the deep underwater canyons that are in front of us. And we have 123 life-size species, including a great white shark and a juvenile gray whale. There were two artists who designed it, Robin Brailsford and Wick Alexander. And together with two assistants, they set 500,000 tiles to create this beautiful mosaic that you see. Next slide, please. Okay. Now, as I told you, we call it an educational plaza, and that's because there's a lot more happening here. We have a plaque that honors the Kumeyaay and the importance of their contributions to the area. We have bronze sculptures of some of the creatures. We partner with the local photographers and divers to create signs showing the species as well. So we have beautiful photographs on those signs. And they have QR codes 
that link to a website where you get a page of information on each creature as well as photos and videos. So our plan originally was to bring groups of uh, school children and uh, other adults to the map in person and then take them out to the beach to explore maybe afterwards or do a beach cleanup. But then of course, COVID came last year. Next slide, please. <laughs> and so like all of you, we had to adapt. Our programs and classes went online. We now do virtual field trips to the map. We also created an online version of it that students can go and visit from anywhere in the world. So if you go to waltermonkway.org, you'll see this virtual map, which is the picture on the left there. And you use it by hovering over a creature. And then as you select it, it brings up a page of information and photos and sometimes even the sounds that the creatures make. So the California sea lion on the right is one of our 123 species. And that is the page that will come up. And as I said, those are photos taken by our local photographers and divers. So I guess uh, I hope that you guys come and check it out. You can visit it virtually online now. And then as things open up, plan a trip to see it in person. It's free to the public and we would love to meet you. So with that, I will give it back to Yvonne. So hi, my name is Dr. Yvonne Marie Andres, and I um, have a long time career in education. I started out um, in Oceanside School District and taught um, elementary school, middle school, high school. But my uh, real niche has been on, in online collaborative learning. Why you should collaborate, how you can successfully collaborate, what tools you use, and how to prove, improve academic, student academic performance by collaborating. So in addition to being the uh, co-founder of Global Schoolnet, which is a 501c3 um, that's dedicated to uh, fostering collaborative learning, I work with Elena on a wonderful project called Global Forest Link, where we have students collaborating from all over the world uh, doing a collaborative analysis of forest health, both um, wilderness and urban forests. So um, Elena told you a lot about the, uh, the visual analysis tool that the students use. And what I want to talk a little bit about is the digital stories. And we made creating digital stories an integral part of Global Forest Link as it is in many of the other uh, projects that, uh, that, that, that the schools I work with you do. And so how does a digital story work? Well, um, what we've learned is that often students working with teachers learn the content, but when they are asked to then uh, create a story about what they learn, they struggle a little bit. So we give them a lot of scaffolding and a lot of uh, support in helping them to create their digital stories, which are made up of original photos and images and artwork, sometimes even original music. They will take uh, interviews with, they'll interview uh, experts, um, they, their teachers, other, other classmates. And we really stress the importance of evidence-based journalism. So everything that they're uh, creating has to be copyrighted. It has to be documented. They're, they have to cite their sources. It's based on uh, original research that they're doing both online and in, out in the field. So they're collecting different uh, items and documenting different items. They're analyzing the data using a lot of the tools you've already heard about and the swab tool. And then they create their video, which can be a, a regular video or it can be a slideshow uh, that's narrated in their own voice. And the idea is for them to teach others about what they learned. So, um, Global Forest Link is, is one of these projects, and that's focused, as I said, on forest health and, and environmental factors that affect uh, forest health. Another project that actually we've been doing in, uh, with Global Schoolnet for now uh, going on 26 years is 
called Cyber Fair, and it's a virtual world's fair. And 26 years ago, we were thinking, what can we do to get kids really knowledgeable about their communities? What are the environmental issues? What are the, the local businesses? What are the local music, arts, special populations? And we thought, well, back in the day, there used to be world's fairs and people used to go and they would learn about other cultures and they would learn about businesses and different foods and so on. And so we decided to create a virtual world's fair. Now, if you can imagine back in 1996, that was pretty, pretty much a unique idea. Well, I'm happy to say that we've been running this program now every year annually since, since 1996. And we've had um, over five and a half million students participate from countries all over the world. It involves students creating digital artifacts about their local community in various categories. Environment is one of the big categories that we often get lots of projects submitted. It's both a competition and an exhibition. So if it's competition, they wanna uh, participate in the competition, they submit their project, and then they're required to review at least six other projects. So what we've learned through this process is that often students love to create content. You know, they create their videos, their TikTok videos or YouTube videos, and they put it out there and then they're off and they're doing the next thing. And they don't really uh, learn what was valuable about theirs, what was, you know, good or not good. So going through the peer review process, they use a rubric and they, they evaluate the other, the, the projects that the other students did, they learn a lot about their own project as well. So it's, it's a really good process because every time they do it, it gets better and better. So we keep these in a gallery on the Global School Net website. We now have more than 40,000 projects from 105 countries. Some of these projects uh, still have websites associated with them ones that were created, you know, 10, 20 years ago, every once in a while I'll hear from students that, you know, were junior high school students and now they're adults and they're working for Netflix and Google and, and all kinds of fun technology companies. So um, they, they learn, in addition to creating these artifacts, they learn very important career readiness skills like project management and time management. So here's one example of a cyber fair project that was trying to raise environmental awareness. This was done by uh, fourth graders in, uh, in North Carolina, 25 students collaborated together to, to create this project. And what was really fun for me about this is this is one of those websites that was created more than 20 years ago and it still exists. So these were fourth graders you know, back then, and you know, now they're out of school, and they're, they're you know, some of them are showing these these projects to to their own children. But the students, this is a quote from their teacher: the students have a new enthusiasm for going green. They're eager to tell other other people how to conserve and grow their own food at home. So you can actually still go to this website and look at the different variations of projects that they did, uh, going green projects. You know, back in as I said, uh, several decades ago. This is also one of my favorite projects. This is uh, a project done by some students in Australia. And their idea was to talk about animal con uh, conservation. And what I really liked about it is they embedded lots of the new technology tools. So they had a Facebook group and they had Twitter feeds and they had Instagram posts. And uh, actually this was before TikTok, so we don't have any of those. But again, this was a, a very fun way to uh, tap into social learning and educate others about uh, the topic that was important to them, which was uh, animal conservation. Now, again, these are just two examples. There are uh, literally thousands of others on the Global School Net website in the, in the cyber fair area that you're welcome to come and take a look at. Um, what I would um, invite you all to do is come and browse around the sites. You can learn from uh, what's already there. In addition to creating the projects, 
they have to create what we call a narrative, which explains the process behind their project. How did they organize their teams? What technologies did they use? What challenges did they face? Um, how did they collaborate? Was it successful? How did they evaluate their projects? And you know, were there, were there any uh, unexpected learning outcomes? So we have collected all of those for all of these those years and those still reside there as i said and in some cases their web projects are still there so everyone this has been uh, an amazing uh, snapshot of four different programs by four different women in technology looking at the environment and education. So what I'd like to say is um, thank you to everyone who's listening. There will be a resource page that has all of the links to the videos and the websites that we've been talking about. So we'll make that available. And But before we go, I'd like each of us speakers to maybe have a few parting words. So Cynthia, what would you like to say for this Earth Day 2021? Since a lot of us are still at home, I'd say if we can take a look around and see what we can do right in our own communities and our own backyards, that that's a great start. But this time next year, if we do this again, which I'd love to do, hopefully I'll report some things from the field, like new kinds of beaked whales and such. So that's my hope that this time next year, I get to see all, all of your faces again. I think we all share that hope with you. <laughs> Elena, how about you? Uh, first of all, uh, it was a pleasure to participate in this kind of uh, the workshop. And second, it's my own resolution. I'm going to, to take lessons of scuba diving. <laughs> I'm just jealous. I'm really jealous. And then who's riding next? Yeah. But uh, hopefully next year, it will be a normal year and the good habits that happened with environment this year probably will stay because people stop driving as crazy and reevaluated their values. Fantastic. And how about you, Beth? Uh, I'm just, again, so pleased to be here and celebrating Earth Day. What, an, what a wonderful, meaningful way to do it. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And I think uh, next year, it's it's funny when it, we all have to know what we're really good at. And one of the things I love to do is to uh, to take the science and be out in the field with with kids in person too. So I would say that um, I'm hoping to see everyone in person again next year. But again, as Miss Cynthia said that. Uh, if you can't go and join a beach cleanup, you know, go and join uh, a neighborhood cleanup. If you take the trash that's off the streets in front of your house, then you keep it from entering the ocean through the, the waterways. So go and uh, volunteer someplace locally too, you know, be a part of your community and be a part of the earth, especially on the special day like Earth Day. So thank you. Fantastic. And I just echo what everybody has said. I want to be out there doing things. I want to be in the water and under the trees and looking at the animals and uh, writing about them and talking about them. But when I can't because of things like this, I still wanna have access to them. So I really appreciate these programs that have really strong online components. And I think our future will be a combination and it's really up to us to, um, to make sense of it and have these blended learning experiences where we can be out there in the field and extend that learning uh, using the technology and maybe even more importantly, get lots and lots of girls involved in science and STEAM like we all are and educate everybody. So happy Earth Day 2021 and um, hope to see you online or in the field. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye.